Welcome to Mercedes in the Chap, a show dedicated to helping humans become extraordinary. Here we'll hone a well-rounded roadmap for us to step into our potential in all things relationships, work, purpose, and legacy. Chap. Disarming. 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 Very that's disarming. That's the word that comes to you. Yeah, this could, because you look at this guy, Dom, and you know he's got it all put together. Everything's clicking. How could he have had a bad experience one day in his life, like perceptively the ultimate hero in a movie? And he is, actually. Uh, but it's how he got there and what he's doing. And he's actually saving men. He's saving, oh, and women too. Literally. He's saving humans. Yeah, by being the example, by being the change, and by putting it out into the world through his own um, work, his own show. He's a two-time author. He is a badass. He's had a TED Talk. I Maybe, maybe more than one, I don't know. He was a former sex addict, and he's basically turned that into his platform for becoming a men's coach and helping guiding men to become more integrated, which I can't think of a better purpose on the earth. So I'm so into the discussion we had today with Dominic Cortuccio, and I just can't wait to share this with our audience. Dom, what's up? It's so, so cool to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming down to play with us. Yeah, thanks for bringing me down here. It's great to finally meet you in person, Mercedes. Give you a hug. And yeah. chap, good to finally meet you too, man. I want to get a hug when we're done. Uh, <laughs> long, slow ones. Oh, yes, perfect. only. Eight, you heard it. <laughs> eight second belly hugs. Eight second belly hugs. Um, so you are this guy who I've been following your work for a long time. I've been privileged enough to interview you before. And... I think what I love most about your work is that it, you can tell it comes from experience and that it's really something that's already been ingrained in you. And now you're able to use that and express it to your audience in such a powerful way. So I'd love to kick off today's show with just talking about how you got to that work and what your shadow sides were maybe mainly around sex addiction, because I know that's one of your major struggles that kind of birthed this work that you're doing now with men. Yeah, thanks, Mercedes. So sex addiction is a really misunderstood and stigmatized addiction. I don't think a lot of people know about it, talk about it, or when they do, they conjure up these images of maybe uh, a pervert on a playground with a trench coat, or you think about Usher, who's having sex with a ton of women, and you're like, I'd love to have those problems. <laughs> and... For me, you know, I, I think it's really important to state, I don't currently identify as a sex addict. Uh, 2013 through 2017, I hit a personal rock bottom. I went into Sex Addicts Anonymous because I had betrayed the one woman that I'd ever had fallen in love with. And she had caught me cheating on her. And I went in to save the relationship. And when I went in uh, to get counseling in Sex Addicts Anonymous, I found out that I had a lot of blind spots, a lot of wounds and demons that I had to uncover. And I reinvented myself and my life through that process. And I think I'm hoping we can talk here today about like what an average guy, what a non-sex addict can learn from someone who went through my experience. Because I believe our relationships with sexuality, most men have never explored their relationship with their own sexuality and where those desires came from, where those insecurities came from, where their kinks came from, and how an unexamined existence around your sexuality usually leads to pretty shitty sex life. So wherever you guys want to go with that, I'm happy to dive in. Yeah, I would love to start with just how you noticed it in you. Besides, obviously, you said, you know, you just briefly mentioned the moment where you cheated on someone who you really loved. I'm sure you went, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this? Like, what was it that um, you saw in yourself or you could really pinpoint for maybe other men watching uh, that they could say, yeah, maybe I do have a problem here. Yeah. So to paint that picture appropriately, who I was at the time in 2013, before I went into sex addicts and recovery, I was someone who was excelling in work. I was kind of this leader in a corporate financial world, a fortune hundred company running an organization of sales organization that had a billion dollar sales goal. So I had a lot of responsibility on the surface. I was a guy that you would trust a guy that, you know, hopefully could be considered a good leader and yet behind the scenes, this one area of my life that I didn't have discipline or control over, this one area of my life where I would make a promise to myself and I would continuously break it, was this area of my own sexuality. Whether it was 
I'm going to stop watching porn. And I would get off of it for a week and then I would get right back to it. Or when I was in that deep, loving, committed relationship, I would say, I'm not going to sext other women. And that would happen for 10 days and then bang, I'd fall right back into it. Every promise I've made to myself around changing my behavior, I constantly broke those promises. That, that had to drive you crazy, right? Cra- crazy, Chad. Because you're very goal-oriented. Yes. Yeah. Every goal I've ever set, you know, whether it's physical goals or goals at work or, you know, my word is my bond. And you could count on me for anything. This was the one area of my life where I just didn't seem to have control over it. Mm, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a really, I mean, it's so powerful, obviously, the kind of thread that we're pulling on through and through the show and that you pull on through your work, Dom, is inner work, like asking people to do their inner work and slow down enough to see what the issue really is at the root. Um, How how does that start? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, Dom's the guy to answer that. Yeah. 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 How how does that start? Okay. For most guys, the way that that starts is they get hit by a Mack truck, right? And I, I like to say there's, there's typically three signs that you need to wake up about something in your life. The first sign is like you get a tap on the shoulder, you know, like something's off. Most guys bulldoze right through that. We ignore that. Mm. Sometimes we get a two by four across the forehead, right? Like you need to wake up and maybe it's say in the context of a relationship, you know, your wife is mad at you, your girlfriend's mad at you. And then you just, you you put it to bed and you don't really address the issue. And then the third one is you get hit by a Mack truck, right? And for me, it was getting caught cheating, um, which is never something I'd ever done in my life before. I never thought I was capable of doing something like that. Of cheating or getting caught cheating? Cheating. Cheating. Okay. Okay, Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, Yeah, that is interesting. I like uh, growing up, it was always about integrity and my word. And this was the one area where I kind of skimmed on all that. Wow. But most guys need a wake up call, a heart attack, losing a job, a global pandemic or being caught, you know, name your version before we will look at actually addressing and going inside and figuring out what's going on in here. So when it came to this, I ended up in Sex Addicts Anonymous, which was, was humiliating, right? Like imagine a guy who's kind of at the top of a really prestigious organization doing good work and then walking into a room where I had to say, hi, I'm Dominic. I'm a sex addict. And that's crazy because, you know, we have real, we've, we've gotten a lot better as a society, uh, destigmatizing like alcoholics, right? But sex is still this forbidden thing, which is why I, 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 I can't, possibly try to imagine that but i i, I if if one tenth of one percent i'm understanding what you're saying that's mind-boggling you, you're nailing it right so there's a lot of celebration for people who go into alcoholics anonymous and come out the other side sober and clean but 50 60 years ago you were considered diseased right you were considered a liability and i still think sex addiction kind of still carries some of those stigmas and i walked in to one of those meetings humiliated when I look at it now, it's I celebrate whoever's going in and getting that help. But yes. at the time, it felt humiliating. That bravery. Mm-hmm. And this gets back to your original question, Mercedes, is like, okay, well, what, what was some of the introspection I had to do to figure out, like, what were the pieces? Like, how, what is the making of a sex addict, yes. you know? That's it, yeah. Right. And the first thing that they had us do was go back in time and look at the forces that shape our sexuality. And for your listeners, who, like wherever you are on the sexual spectrum, right? Whether you have a great healthy relationship with it, or maybe you have some guilt and shame around it. Like, I think these four forces are really helpful for you. I call them the four F's. Your family and their influence. Your faith, what it, faith had to say about it. Or if you didn't have a faith, like even the absence of faith, it does have some impact on how you, you, know, you form your sexuality. Your friends, what did you learn from them when you were growing up? And then this last category I call film, what you see in media, TV, and then obviously pornography, which we're going to have a totally separate conversation about. But I'm happy to kind of dive into each of those categories at a high level so you can kind of see how my upbringing caused me to feel ashamed and guilty about my sexuality that took a lot of my behaviors underground. Yeah, I would love to dive into the four the four Fs is that or four yeah. forces the four Fs yeah yeah that you're you're uh, kind of famous for now <laughs> um, giving giving guys really a structure for how to approach if they are dealing with something that might be um, in the unhealthy realm right when it comes to being a sexual person <laughs> yeah I mean it could be unhealthy or even just getting a bigger insight as to why you like what you like or how you behave with sexuality the way that you do why you consume the porn that you do yeah. The first one, what did your family have to say? 
about sex when you were growing up. For example, in my, ha- my family household, and I love my parents, we had the closest relationship in the world. When it came to sex, we didn't talk about it, mm. right? Eight years old, Friday night, we're watching family movie night, PG movies were like as, as, as edgy as we got at my household. And then if there was a scene where like a man and a woman were kissing, my parents would lunge across the couch. My dad would be like, no, and cover my <laughs> eyes. And the collective sphincter of the room would tighten up and it would get all anxious and nervous. And it was interesting because my body was reacting a certain way to what I was seeing on the screen. You know, like I wanted to see her shirt come off. But then what I was met with in the household was like, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. And immediately that moment and moments like that taught me that sexual situations were bad. They were wrong, right? Even though my body was telling me something different. Right. And when I combine that with faith, right? So family's the first one, faith. I grew up in a very religious household, went to seven years of Catholic school. The faith I was taught was premarital sex, you're going to hell, right? If you have sexual thoughts, it's deviant. So all of a sudden, I'm a young kid. I have no one to talk to about this stuff. My body's coming online. I'm feeling feelings. And I know, or I've been taught right away that that's wrong and bad, So I've got this inner conflict that's born from a very early age of what I feel, what I'm drawn to, and I'm looking at every Playboy I can get my hands on at the time. I'm 43 years old, so that gives you kind of a, I was a Playboy era. (laughs) But what was taught, and that created a big divergence in who I could be publicly, and then what I really was wanting to do privately. And a little bit of that, and I don't know, I'm asking, but it sounds like a little bit of that is like the, the, the challenge of maybe not is the mystique or the challenge of kind of like, I don't want to say not getting caught, but it, because it's taboo, it drives you to it. Yeah. So what's interesting about that chap is my, my podcast partner, his name is Brian Stacy. He loved when he was a kid, that taboo of like, I'm not supposed to be having this playboy. It's under my, you know, my, my, my mattress cover and I hope my parents don't catch me. There was like a, like the spy craft. It's of exciting. It. Yeah. yeah. He, it was exciting for him. Here's where it was different for me. And I think a lot of your listeners could probably relate to this. I felt ashamed, mm-hmm. right? I, like, like, so we, we took the same situation. Brian, it was a turn on. It was electrifying for him. For me, I thought I was going to hell mm-hmm. or I thought I was a bad kid. And even on, a, on like a microscopic level, that seed that was planted as an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, as those, as those things grow forward, it, it literally created two versions of Dominic. It was my public Dominic that I let the world see because that was what's okay. That's what my parents appreciated. That's what the priests told me were good. And then there was the secret Dominic who got to do what he really wanted to do. And when the internet started coming online, like I think I was like 15, 16 years old and I could talk to women around the world and they could send me pictures. Like no one knew about that. And I had these two separate tracks that diverge and I kept two separate Dominics for decades before I came crashing down and, you know, ended up cheating on my partner and betraying her. And so this had been going on for a while. Yeah. And that was your, uh, the little tap on the shoulder and then the, the getting hit by the two by four. That's right. The, the Mack truck was what ran me over. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> There's so many ways that I want to, to kind of dissect this, but to start with the piece about, you know, how family sees sex or talks about or doesn't talk about it. Um, now you're 43, you, I don't know if you're in relationship now, but if you're looking to have a family going forward, have you thought about how you would approach this in your own family if you had a son, for instance? That's a great question, Mercedes. And I'm not in a partnership now. I do want that. I do want to have kids. And I absolutely am going to create a shame-free, transparent environment around sexuality. Sex is a beautiful thing. If we talk about it, if we, first of all, all the reason why all of us are here right now is because two people decide to have sex, right? And it's a creative energy that's beautiful, that's natural inside of all of us. It's also a very powerful energy. It could be used for beautiful things, connection, intimacy, vibrancy, life. It could be used for destruction too. And we've seen that in aggressive forms of behavior or, you know, in being in the rooms of Sex Addicts Anonymous for four years, when I say in the rooms, I mean, you know, guys who are coming to weekly meetings or daily meetings, I had a chance to see a way a lot of their stuff manifested. I would say more than half of the guys who are in Sex Addicts Anonymous came from a very strict religious upbringing. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, it's not surprising. My Catholic upbringing, yeah, definitely held a lot of shame for me around sexuality. Yeah, and is that is that something that you still navigate today? Uh, for sure, it's like kind of so deeply ingrained that I definitely navigate it. But I mean, I've uncovered so much of it that I'd say I'm ninety percent, you know, better than where I was. So. And, and it's interesting because I'm the opposite. I'm the product of a porn shoot gone really bad. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> but sorry. Um, so the, so I didn't. <laughs> that well, really, been really good because I, I think I'm pretty great. The, what's the, the the second F? Uh, so, so, so the, faith, the first, oh, right? yeah, faith. yeah, family. But that, okay. That's what the dovetail into it. Yeah. Family and faith are the first right. two. Yeah. Lives. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, yeah that, and with you in your case, in your case, Mercedes, it's, it's very similar. They well, kind of. Yeah. And I mean, I think faith for so many people as Dom is obviously he's saying he's, he's seen in his work and in, and being in sex addicts anonymous, it's so powerful because it starts, I think at such a young age and it is the thing that the most powerful thing uh, humans question, like this existentialism, right? Existential questioning that we do is tied usually largely to our faith. If we had someone in our life tell us we're going to, you know, this is our direction. This is the structure we're going to follow. This is the dogma we're going to follow. So then the groove that that it creates inside your body, you know, your memory um, is so deep that it's very hard to, to let go Extract it or whatever. It's even yeah. see that that's uh, the issue yeah. a lot of the time. But Dom, I know you had this um, phase in your journey that you called spiritual homelessness. Yeah. And I would love to explore that within the, the second F, faith. Yeah, I mean, you know, so I had about a 15-year period of my life. I, I would say probably from 20 to 35 where I was spiritually homeless. And the reason for that is when, um, when I got out of my household and I got to college, I could start making my own decisions around religion, faith, and questioning what I had learned, I felt really jaded about what I had learned. So the, the first thing here is this is not a religion shaming conversation. I have, I have deep respect for religion and a lot of people in my, close to me in my life are deeply religious and I love the role that plays in their lives. Agreed. From my personal experience, what I went through was fear-based faith, right? So fear God, fear Jesus. He's looking at you and, you know, He's keeping a tally of all the times I'm masturbating and <laughs> killing kittens in my, you know, like all of those moments that, that, that yeah. terrified me. And, and I said, isn't faith supposed to be something that's loving and gives people hope? And I couldn't find that anywhere. And I got really angry yeah. and my anger peaked when I ended up in Sex Addicts Anonymous, when I finally was given the tools to look back at how was my sexuality shaped? And I got really angry at my family. I got really angry when I looked back at my faith and how it took something that's a beautiful part of our human, you know, experience, this sexual energy, and it turned into something that was deviant or, you know, something to be hidden or something that I feel guilt about. Something that's not spiritual is, right. that's what's crazy to me is that somehow some, uh, you know, some churches, <laughs> some of the dogma makes sexuality not spiritual. Right. When I had to feel like it couldn't be farther um, I mean, it is, like, it's the same energy. It is so much part of spirituality for me. That, that your nail in a Mercedes is like, it, it, it's considered to be the anti-spiritual. You are, you are going to the place down below yeah. if you engage in this or if you let it sweep you away. And I've had to work my ass off to uncondition all of that. And so I got angry. And for those 15 years, I was really kind of on my own, you know, spiritually um, but once I got rid of that anger, because I didn't want to carry around animosity or, you know, resentment toward, like animosity and resentment don't have a place in the kind of man I'm trying to create for myself, right? Mm -hmm. So when I recognized the one place left that I had anger was faith, it was like, I got to say goodbye to that. And I, and I went through a whole, a whole thing around that. That probably won't be interesting to too many of your listeners, but, but I'm now back on a path where I'm much more spiritual and open-minded around all of that. Yeah. And I find it extremely interesting and maybe we'll get to that on another podcast but we only have a limited amount of time so yeah. I'm going to move us forward into the third F. Yeah your friends. Yeah. So you know when you're a kid growing up and you know you're around a group of friends they shape you know who are you spending your time with they shape a large portion of your relationship with what sex is and for many young boys sex is about power right like who's the first kid who you know got access to porn who's the first kid who got you know, who got laid and it becomes a big power play. 
And then what are your friends saying about it? So it was really interesting, you know, being a 43 year old guy, like we had access to <laughs> two dimensional analog porn, which is Playboy magazines, mm -hmm. right? Kids, you know, maybe 10 years younger than me had access to maybe more high speed internet. Kids today who are strum stumbling across pornography and these other things are getting access to like some of the most intense stuff that's out there and their friends are turning them on to it. So back in my day, my friends, when, when we were talking about, say, masturbation, you were considered a weirdo, a pariah, like a, you know, a pervert if you jerked off. And that was right around the time that I had discovered jerking off, which was, to me, it felt amazing, right? But to them, it was like, let's find out who's doing it, and then let's obliterate that person socially. Well, and there's all sorts of reasons, obviously, why they were doing that in their own internal struggle of life. But you're Well, right. probably goes back to family and faith. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. right. They were probably yeah. doing it more yeah. than anyone, right? And, and we know doing... now that, that kids actually lie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know now. So you know. Okay. <laughs> but anyway. at the time, yeah, at the time you don't know. And yeah, you don't know. And so if you, if you guys look at like the three major forces, like the, where I spent my time in community, my family, my faith, my friends, I was always at risk of being exposed. Yeah, you've got three strikes against you right now. Run right on. Yeah. And I was terrified. Like, so, so again, it was keep this secret, you know, do this thing and in, in private. And when I say do this thing, it was either looking at porn or when I discovered masturbation, which is kind of a, a funny story. Um, are you all familiar with the, the movie White Men Can't Jump? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Woody Harrelson, Wesley Snipes, and God bless her, Rosie Perez. <laughs> right? She has no idea the role that she played in making me a man. Um, <laughs> like my parents were very strict at how in the, ho in the home, they would never let me watch like a rated R movie, but they slipped up one day mm. and they left the house with a rated R movie and it was white men can't jump. And I put it on play and Rosie like jumps on Woody Harrelson in one scene. She takes her top off and I'm watching this movie. I'm replaying it, rewinding it, replaying it, rewinding it. And then all of a sudden before I knew it, you know, I'm rubbing myself and before I knew it, it was just like this boom, supernova explosion. And this force of energy came through my body like a New York City fire truck barreling down Broadway. It was like, you know, I blacked out for a second. <laughs> and, and then I came to and I had this huge wet spot in my pants. I'm like, what the hell was that? But that was the thing that was like, oh my God. It's like, I got this pile of heroin between my legs that I can pull on any time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was the thing that, you know, it became kind of a, a habitual chronic thing that I would use anytime I felt bored or lonely or stressed. Well, it's like a free cigarette or yeah. whatever. For, yeah. Like right the here. Alcohol shot. Yeah, All the time. Is. Heroin. That's access crazy. to heroin. Yeah. 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 Can't fall asleep. Yeah, exactly. And, and how do you battle that? As a kid, like you don't, you don't even think about battling that. Yeah. Right. It's just like, Oh, well, this is what I do. And it feels really, it feels really awesome. And, but I can't let anyone else know about it. So again, that was another thing that went into this secret world. And I think a lot of guys, no matter where you are on that realm, it's, yeah, I, I can relate to this idea of having a secret life, whether it's the kink I have, or maybe I'm gay and I haven't let anyone know about it, or, you know, there's something I can't let my girlfriend know about. I think a lot of guys can relate to this. There's a part of me that is not welcome. It's not allowed to exist or pretend right. it doesn't. Right. And so it's looking at these areas to say, what did you learn when you were growing up that told you that a part of you wasn't okay? Yeah. And so that was friends and film is fairly obvious, but yeah. so that was really a matter of where did you get these concepts in the first place? Yeah. It's and the just film more is, another layer of that. Yeah. And the yeah. film is so interesting because we all, you know, and, and in, in a way you could say, and I'm not officially saying this, but I mean, one could opine that the, the industry of entertainment is just, by the way, it's just make about making money. Right. And they, and so is, so is cigarette manufacturing. Right. And so it's kind of like what you just brought up here is it seems like one could argue that it's the same thing. Well, yeah. even on this show, we are aware of what sexuality, uh, what the value of beauty and sexuality brings to our plat, you know, allows our access to more audience. And so we do exploit it to that degree. And being in the media, being in an influencer, being in the entertainment industry, yeah, you are looking to find a way to sell your product because you have to make it sustainable, even if your product has integrity. 
So it is interesting, you know. But if you can balance that, that's, right? that's I think the, that's the key. And that yeah. sounds like that's what you're doing really well. And I think some of our guests are are also really, I think, but this is the year and the, the time we live in is we're more aware as a, as a, as a culture and we are trying to be, profitable because we live in a capitalistic world, but profitable, but also highly as, as, as ethical as we can be. Yep. And so how do you, you know, I, I'm really interested in the, the, the final F. Um, if, can you, well, that was film. Yeah. It is, but I mean, you know, we have the Rosie Perez example, but what other just general thoughts do you have on this world of, of that? The, the, the kind of the, uh, the entertainment industry, the racketeering or whatever <laughs> it is. Yeah. The trafficking in, in, in this. Yeah, I mean, film is really interesting because sex sells, right? We've heard that forever, and it does. And there's this inherent conflict of, you know, many of us who have grown up, grown, grow up with the idea that sex is bad, it's something to be feared, and maybe you have a religious, you know, uh, obstacle there. But then when it comes to film, it's just so in your face, you know, from, and when I say film, it's media, it's movies right. and everything. So you, from the Victoria's Secret catalog to the, you know, Rosie Perez and White Man Can't Jump to... Um, to now all forms of social media. I mean, you're just like, your your social feed is blasted with sexuality in, in, in so many forms. And then of course, porn has never been more available. So like you're, you're in one side being told all these things about, um, about sex that are bad, wrong, guilty, question yourself. And then you're being fire hosed with it down this other side. I think a lot of people just like don't even understand the way that that scrambles your brain. And a 13-year-old boy certainly doesn't understand that. Of course not. Of course not. And, and, and who does he have to go to to talk to about this stuff? Other 13-year-old boys? That, God, that's a yeah, great that's idea. Great. Right. So, Genius. Yeah, so, so, we, so we wonder, and, and, and there's a lot of, so you know, when I speak about this stuff, I get a lot of women who are like, thank you. Where are the guys who are doing this inner work? I mean, they're crying all over my Instagram feed every time I post something. It's like, where are the guys who care about this stuff? We've, like, we, we've been fucked up a lot with the messages that we've been, you know, that we've been fire hosed with. And so I'm just here to, to provide a different voice to say, look, I know that we got some screwed up messages as we grew up and it can scramble you. But if you now are coming to this awakening and you're starting to look at yourself and say, I'm not having the kind of sex that I want. I'm watching more porn than I want to. I'm pornifying my relationships. I've, you know, like if, if you're at that place and you're starting to think about that, then it's now your time to actually ask some of the, excuse me, some of the deeper questions around what did my faith, what did my family, what did my friends, and what impact did film have on how I view the world? But I think too, right, and, and this all sounds like a, 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 a movie, and it, it talk about film, and it sounds like a, it sounds like a movie with we're, we're head, it seems like we're heading in a in an ending that could be sad for our guys at home watching this. But the reality is the fact that you're watching this and you're listening to this and you're sticking with us, exactly, and you're seeing it, and you're there's so much hope here. Well, and I think that you know, as a woman in in this conversation with you guys right now, if I was single, the first place I would go to like because you have these women that come and say, Dom, where are these guys doing this inner work? Like, please send me your roster of men that you're working with. You know what I mean? Um, I would literally hang out at the outside as a a studio. Literally. (laughs) I would hang, I would be like, yeah, like who has graduated your courses? I need to know those men or, um, where do the local men's group hang out? I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to be waiting in the parking lot like a creedler. Dom, let me, ask, let me ask you something. Let me, let me ask you real, real quick as a, as a sidebar here. Is Mercedes one of the smartest people you've ever met? <laughs> yeah, she's, yeah. Don't put her, don't put him on the spot or anything. You well, have the to second say... smartest person you've ever <laughs> behind, behind you, the chap yeah. Yeah, behind me, yeah. of course. Yeah, not really. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think that's really good. I mean, I think, and this is something Mercedes has I always think been. I might be the most, the smartest potential um i'm hoping that women understand that that is the smartest move you can do if you're single wow because yeah, here's absolutely. why i mean and obviously dom can attest to this but all women that i have ever spoken to that have any i any bit of consciousness about what they want in their life say that what they want is a man who will grow because he's willing to do the work yeah. in relationship out of relationship on himself in, you know, in the dynamic of whatever they've got going on between them. 
And that's it. That's literally the number one before any other thing that you might think, hot bod, big dick, you know, um, he's a astrophysicist. I don't care anything else. Right. All she wants to know is that he's willing to show up and do the work. I, I'd love to say something on that. Cause you, that's a hundred percent is you have to think about when, when I entered sex addicts anonymous, my biggest fear was anyone finding out. I never want to talk about this thing because I'm like, I'm going to be toxic. Who's going to hire me? Mm-hmm. Who's going to want to date me? Like I had all these greatest fears because remember like that secret Dominic was built because I thought I'd be rejected everywhere. The I trench go. coat guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the trend, trench coat Dominic. Exactly. No one's going to want to hang out with him. But what I found out was when I did the work, like yeah. Mercedes is talking about, and then I came and I spoke openly about it. Of course it ruffled some feathers. Right. And at the same time, I have never been more embraced, more trusted. You know, people, people look to me because like, I think you had opened it up with, I speak honestly, truthfully. There's a whole host of people who can't handle that, don't want to get anywhere near this. And that's great because I don't have to fake being around those people anymore. I can just be 100% of myself. And the women that come into my life now who are attracted to me for the work for I've you, done. who you actually me, are. Yeah. Exactly. Like this integrate, there is no, there's no secret and public Dominic. There's one me, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, freeing and liberating. And for all the guys who are listening, it's like all those, you know, pickup artist books. And I read the game, you know, Neil Strauss, just like every other guy did. And all those things that you're trying to work on on the surface level. Yeah. They may get you a date or two, and maybe you might fool somebody for a little while. But the thing that like you want, if you really want enduring connection with someone who likes you for you, then there is no shortcut. You, you have to do this work. And the things that you think about yourself that like no one would ever want or love, like I did with this thing, turns out to be the very thing that I speak openly about and what right. people know me and like me for the best. Absolutely. And it's what you're describing is that transition from, you know, you're alchemizing pain to purpose. And that's what you've done with your life. You've found your darknesses because you're willing to look at the shadows and you've done the work, you've alchemized that stuff into your light, right? And not to get into that whole esoteric world, but that's really what's happening. And it's so beautiful because it, just the way you articulated it now, describes what I think is maybe the most elusive thing for humankind, and that is how to be whole. Everyone hears that, and they don't understand what does that actually look like in walking life, right? Um, And you're a great example of this because you are doing the work of integrating, becoming in integrity. And that is what wholeness actually means. And to kind of just full circle this with the faith faith piece of um, what you discussed in the four F's, the idea of holiness, or even like if we want to talk about Christianity, the Christed path, that is what Jesus or Buddha or any of these, you know, spiritual masters or gurus are prescribing uh, is to figure out how to be in integrity, how to be whole, which means you are one person all the time. You're impeccable with your word. You're impeccable with yourself. You don't sin, which is just trespassing yourself or others. Yeah. So, and, and an beautiful. interesting thing about that. Yeah. And, and, and Dom was not witness to our other guests and, and everybody's kind of on their own, but right. there's this reoccurring theme that we hear over and over and over and over again. We're hearing it right now. And it's be yourself. Yeah. Be honest with yourself. Be it yourself. Seems simple, but no it one knows how simple, to do it. Seems simple, but no, they don't because they're too busy. Like you were saying, maybe trying to figure out the surface level how to do these pickup lines. And we've had a lot of female guests on here, and and and, and a male guest that all have given us these stories where that is held true every time. And yep. and and it's amazing. And listen, Dom, you are going to come back on the show. That's are you right. Not? We yeah. Are make oh you. yeah. Well, I I I think we have a few more minutes with them because I want to talk about how you actually pieced all of those things together, which maybe this is like the focus for, I feel like for me, it's always been um, the thing I have to go, oh, I'm not pulling that back in to my life. And that's why I'm straying from the path I want to be on and why I'm straying out of integrity. And that is accountability. And you have something you call lone wolfing your life, which I would love for you to describe for our audience. Because I think this is a thing so many dudes are doing in their life. Yeah. You know, so the lone wolf is the man who's going about his life mentally and emotionally and spiritually. If, if that's a word that like resonates with you, if it doesn't, that's fine. But mentally, emotionally, and spiritually on your own. 
And I think a lot of guys understand this idea of being a rugged individualist. Like the cowboy. I'm the cowboy. Mm. That's exactly yeah. it. And we, we see movie again, film, you know, like we see movies about it where it's like that, that's who you want to be you against the world. You don't need help. And so that's what makes you a man. That's what makes you masculine. That's what makes you desirable. And so we, when we have a problem, we don't talk about it. You know, like I had this secret Dominic that I didn't tell anybody. I had closest friends in the world. They knew nothing about this for 20 years. No one. It took a Mack truck to hit me before I finally like couldn't ignore it anymore. And that was the thing that, that finally... But when I went into the rooms of Sex Addicts Anonymous and I was surrounded by guys who had been to the bottom too, who wanted to hear what was going on, I would never, never in my life been listened to without judgment, mm. without guys spattering advice at me with the machine, like, here's what you should do and tell, you know, like, or tell me to suck it up and man up. And they just listened. They related. They told me what was going on. They showed me how they started to recover. And it scrambled my brain for like three months. I didn't even actually know how to receive any of that because I was so used to competing with other guys and whatever, like who's the alpha, who, you know. And that is the thing that when I see, I saw how my whole life changed. Like I got to reclaim myself and that wholeness you were saying that I was like, I got to bring this to other guys. And so if you're going to actually take a look at being yourself, chap, like what you said, be yourself, Okay, that's the obvious part. How do you do that? You can't do it on your own. Many guys have tried. Most guys have failed. Mm -hmm. So it's about, you know, starting to read the books, listen to the podcast, but then get, like, start to find other communities, hire a coach, you know, come join one of the things that I'm doing. That's how, that, that, that's how you start to look at the past so you can change your present and then live into a future that you actually want to live yeah, into. And, that, and, that, and that's back to, uh, you've got two things going on here. Again, I mean, you have multiple things going on here, but one is, movies tell us to be the lone wolf yeah. and um, being, you know, being yourself again, but you actually have to do the work. It's like, don't just buy the book, right? You have to read it. Yeah. And you know, it's so easy to say that, duh, but it's like, well, that's why I bought the book to read it. Yeah, really? And I that's mean, the piece, the accountability piece, because when you involve other people, whether you're paying a, I don't know, maybe it's a, a men's coach, a elder male mentor of some sort, um, you're joining a brotherhood, Maybe you have a therapist, you know, someone who you have to be accountable to or several people if you're joining some sort of um, men's group or brotherhood. Now you, you, yes, you could still just not show up, but it's much more likely you're going to show up amongst these peers or amongst, amongst this mentor what, rather than if you were lone, lone wolf in your life, you are definitely not going to be as accountable and you're probably going to fail. It's just critical. Accountability is so critical. We don't build it into our life that we think we're supposed to be independent, do it all of our, all on our own, especially men feel like they have to do it all on their own. Right well on. said. Yeah. Amazing. We're and great, we great. don't, we are no, synergistic. We Thank, beings. Thankfully we don't. Thankfully yes. We don't. And um, really on that, I guess we can wrap, but we are going to definitely have you, Back to talk about so much more. So I'm excited for that. Um, I did want to just pull on one piece with the lone wolf in your life, though. Were, did you consider yourself an introvert at any point? And I ask that because I feel like an introverted guy is, you know, in that lone wolf mindset. Not that nothing against introverts. I I would consider myself one, which is kind of strange. But um, I know that that piece in me is what makes me shy away from wanting to be accountable that part of me that wants to like kind of shelter myself from other people telling me what I should be doing. <laughs> Mercedes, thanks for bringing that up because there, there is some confusion sometimes when I put out the lone wolf stuff. I have mm -hmm. a lot of introverts who come to me and are like, but That's I'm different though. That's different. They're very different. Very That's different. exactly right. Yeah. They're very different. So introverted is, yeah, like you, you get energy from processing in solitude and you like to, you know, your own thoughts. Maybe you have a small circle of confidants. But what I'm saying here is the lone wolf doesn't even have anybody that they can go to to confide in. You can't process everything on your own. Yes, you can start that process. Yes, you may need to go into meditation or silence or go, you know, go on a farm somewhere. Like do whatever you need to do as an introvert to fill your tank. But if you have nobody who knows what your inner world actually feels like, right. who, 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 nobody who actually knows the problems or the fears, the insecurities or the obstacles, if you, there's no one in your life, that, then you are lone wolfing it. And so even, of, of course, introverts have an opportunity to, it, your, your, your wolf pack may be one other person. That's it, right? We're not saying you need to join a group of 20 guys, but you need to have someone in your corner who knows what's going on in there that can help you navigate some of this stuff. And how do you know when that's the right friend like or the wrong friend? 
Um, I, I would say it's, it's, it's really obvious how you feel. Like if, if, if you are bringing, if I had brought what was going on in my life around sex addiction to someone mm-hmm. who then judges me, who then tells me what I need to do, where I feel like he doesn't understand yeah. anything. He's just, he's just reacting. Mm-hmm. Wrong person. But the people who I ended up bringing it to were the people who were like, man, that sounds really hard. Thanks for finally sharing that with me. I've always wondered what's going on behind your wall. You know, then it felt safe. It felt like, oh, this person's making an effort to understand me. That was very clear who I could tell this to and who was the wrong and, person. And when in doubt, a good friend is a good listener. And they don't right. even have to tell you anything. They right. just show up to coffee. They sit there and listen. They smile. They give you a hug. And that's the end of it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that could be that simple. Yeah. Yep. And paying a professional is always a good idea. <laughs> it's a great first start too. Yeah, yeah that's and what speaking to speaking, of that, speaking of that on Instagram, <laughs> it's at Dominic Q. Yeah, right. And then podcast the Great Man Within, which I could not recommend more. I Amazing. think Dom, your yeah. work is so uh, needed in this world, and so I just want to give you all the praise for doing it because you did have to really, you know, slay your dragons in order to get to the place where you could give back to your community. And I see you and I'm so glad that you are doing that work for even my male audience and that you're sharing it here with us on the show. So I just want you to know that I appreciate you. Appreciate you too, Mercedes. And I'm very, very happy to know you, by the way. Yeah. No, I am serious. Like this is really like, he has Amazing. a 15 year old son. Yes. Is, it, is, I, is, this, is this time for our long, slow hug that we, we talked <laughs> about? We'll do it. We'll do it, but we got to take our earpieces off and we'll, we'll just do it all set. But uh, no, seriously, though, I do. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll wrap it up. Sorry. But, but uh, yeah, I have a 15 year old son, and, and a lot of what you've been talking about, I'm just driving me mad. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Cool. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Dan.